My name is Kim Simpson. I'm here with Dr. Tessa Whitehouse, who's a senior lecturer at uh, Queen Mary University of London. Um, so welcome, Tessa. Thank you so much for being here. Um, what are we going to be talking about today? Thanks for the invitation, Kim. What we're talking about in this session is Cooper as a letter writer and the importance of this configuration of religion and letter writing and friendship in his letters and also the letters of other people for whom religion was a really important part of their lives. So what is it that we learn about religion and about friendship from Cooper's letters in particular, would you say? Well, Cooper, Cooper was really widely admired as a correspondent. I think that's one of the first things to say. His poetry was very well received in his own lifetime. And very soon after his death, his friend William Haley published a, a sort of memoir, which included a lot of his letters, for, which were then published for the first time, attributed to him in 1803. And it was really well received and people really, really enjoyed um, or Haley hoped they'd enjoy the kind of lively sweetness and the attention to small details in those letters. So, so the climate for published letters in the later 18th century and the early 19th century is something that might be quite hard for us to understand, that it was so vibrant. It was a really quite common thing to do for clergymen or Methodist preachers or women who were known to have led very pious lives for biographies with published letters to be circulated quite widely. Cooper was very good friends with John Newton, as we know, um, the evangelical Anglican clergyman, and he published numerous volumes of letters in his own lifetime under the title Cardiphonia. And it was Cooper who actually came up with this title, which means speaking from the heart. So Cooper was very immersed in this culture of letter writing and faith and trying to speak intimately to your personal friends, but also imagining a wider audience of people who shared your concerns with piety and your interest in self-reflection. John Newton was quite um, unusual in some ways for publishing letters in his own lifetime. And one of the reasons he gave for doing that, this is in the preface to Cardiphonia, he said, that letters written to intimate friends, some will be too trivial to deserve notice. And they might be so intermingled with details of private or domestic concerns to not be suitable for publication. But that wasn't really something that troubled Cooper in his own letter writing. And it didn't trouble William Haley either. And in fact, as I've said, Haley kind of set up as a thing for praise this minute attention to daily life and it was the domestic concerns of his letters that readers found very appealing. In his monograph about letters, The Converse of the Pen, Bruce Redford talks about Cooper finding letters to all kinds of friends but particularly friends who shared his religious preoccupations as a psychological necessity. So here we have letters as not just being to help other people but to really intensely help yourself to navigate a kind of hostile or confusing world and Cooper taking great comfort in the small world that he can imagine of a letter to a friend and we see that in the letters of religious women as well. That's, that's fascinating because whenever we think about letters that are written for publication we tend to think of them as a sort of outward facing kind of performance based um, form whereas actually what you're talking about is something that's kind of deeply personal and psychological as well. Mm. It's interesting to see those two things kind of um, mixed together but your research in particular focuses on, on women's letters and you're looking at women who are of dissenting religions is that right? Yeah well the Pair of correspondence I'd most like to talk about in relation to Cooper, because I think there's some very significant parallels between them, are a pair of women called Sally Wesley and Mercy Doddridge, whose surnames probably are familiar to the people following along this day, but the women themselves maybe not so much. Sally Wesley was the daughter of Charles Wesley and the niece of John Wesley. So her father, Charles, is the hymnodist and founder of Methodism. And he and his wife and family and daughters were Methodists, but they were also Anglicans throughout their lives. They never left the Church of England. So Sally Wesley has this quite uncertain religious status, um, as did Cooper in quite a different way, of course, because he had these great doubts about his own salvation. He had these kind of terrifying confrontations with himself about religion. 
Mercy Doddridge was the daughter of Philip Doddridge, who's probably less well known today, but at this time in the later 18th century, even though he died in the 1750s, he was still a really popular religious writer. He was a nonconformist minister, a kind of moderate and orthodox dissenter. And in fact, he was one of Cooper's favourite religious writers. He wrote to one of his cousins in 1766, a kind of letter of religious guidance, where he said, I know no greater names in divinity than Watts, that's Isaac Watts and Doddridge, um, and then goes on to quote Doddridge in a course of a debate, interestingly enough, about the social dimensions of the afterlife, about what kind of society we can imagine after our deaths. Um, so Mercy Doddridge, his daughter, was not a significant literary person. And the work I've done on her letters shows that it's kind of unfortunate that she and Sally Wesley, too, who was a poet, but who avoided publication, that because they didn't publish, they kind of dropped out of even scholarly awareness. And certainly there's no chance of them having kind of awareness among the general public. But their letters are really fascinating. They correspond for several decades, you know, from the letters I found start in the 1780s and go on right up to Mercy Doddridge's death at the beginning of the 19th century. And they talk about very conventional things, you know, daily life, family members, but they talk a lot about their religious thoughts and also troubles, the things they're concerned about, such as the extent to which they can hope to meet friends in the afterlife. This is a really big topic of concern for them. And they think they will. Mercy Doddridge has this quite sweet phrase in a letter to Sally Wesley where she says, she's going to pray that our friendship can extend to the blissful register of our immortality. <laughs> so she's kind of given this boost to Sally Wesley that, you know, they will both be saved. They will both go to heaven. And they're conscious as well of their own status, how their family, the, the kind of fame in religious circles of their family names puts this kind of pressure on them, but also gives them a gift as they see it. So they talk to each other about um, piety and how to pass it on to further generations. And that, of course, is also a really important aspect of letters is that even if they're not published, physical letters can be kept. And Sally Wesley and Mercy Doddridge were both, because they both lived a long time, they ended up being the members of their families who did keep the family archives mm. and encouraged their nieces and other people, um, because neither of them had children of their own, to encourage mm. nieces and other relatives to read these letters mm. and to learn from them, both about letter writing and also about piety. That's really interesting. So it's a sort of in-house version of conduct books. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it was really common, not just in religious families, but of course I'm looking at it more in dissenting and families where religion was an important part of their identities. And it is really often a woman who becomes the person who carries the family archive with them and kind of keeps diaries and letters and tells other family members about them. There's a Baptist woman who lives in the southwest of England called Jane Atwater, who's doing a similar thing at this kind of time as well. And they don't necessarily know each other, but they're all part of this shared culture of religion and letter writing. It's a really interesting kind of counterpart, I suppose, to the men's published letters and published Absolutely. lives that evolve around kind of print and print practices versus letters and manuscripts um, and, and a kind of female inheritance, I suppose. I hadn't really thought about it like that before. Yeah, so. that's a really good way of putting it. And they, they also have a very active intellectual life as well. So um, while there are these kind of different channels of um, kind of writing and reading, it's not necessarily the case that the women are only concerned with domestic matters. So one of the things that really struck me as a similarity between Cooper's letters and um, Sally Wesley and Mercy Doddridge's letters is that they seek advice about reading. And some of the reading is quite heterodox or surprising. One of Cooper's correspondents was a dissenting minister called William Bull, who ran an academy at Newport Pagnell, which is about, it's fairly close to only about six miles away. And when they met in the early 1780s and became friends, Cooper was really taken with William Bull. And he wrote to William Unwin in terms of great praise about this man. And he said, you know, he's very imaginative and he really kind of lets his imagination 
run wild when he's with sympathetic company and he has a tendency to melancholy. So clearly Cooper recognised some, some kind of similar characteristics. But William Bull introduced him to reading that he might not have encountered otherwise, which is one of the things I wanted to say. So it was um, William Bull, I think, who recommended that Cooper read Catherine Macaulay's history. But he also lent him the poetry of a French Catholic writer called Madame Guillon, who John Wesley had been interested in and had done a kind of translation, commissioned a translation of some of her meditations. But it was mainly the Quakers who were associated with Guillon in English culture. So it's quite an unusual thing for Cooper to be reading, but he absolutely loved Madame Guillon's poetry. And William Bull encouraged him to translate it. And he did do some translations and circulated them among other correspondents. So we see also this idea of a correspondence network as well, of not just the individual relationship between the sender and the recipient, and not just the kind of potential future imagined audience of readers of a published version, but also this informal society of other people that Cooper's writing to who might be interested in this quite surprising text. Mm -hmm. And Mercy Doddridge and Sally Wesley have a similar thing, which I think as women might be even more heightened. So Sally Wesley asks Mercy Doddridge if she's read Madame Roland's memoirs. This is the revolutionary and politician. And Mercy Doddridge says she hasn't read the book, but she's read quite a long extract of it in the monthly review. And she would really like to read the book. And she'd also like to read Helen Mariah Williams's Letters from France. But she's part of a reading society at home in Tewkesbury. And she doesn't think the other members would approve of those texts. But Mercy Doddridge herself really wants to read them to understand this, you know, complex and surprising world that they're living in and so she's happy that she's friends with Sally Wesley so she can talk about these books with her and the ideas that might not be acceptable in kind of tea, tea table society that she's moving in every day but in this so the letters give her a more intellectual realm as well as a religious realm and letters as a literary form for those women too and not just as an emotional outlet although that was really important but also as a way of demonstrating and practicing their own creative skills too. And Timothy Whelan's written a bit about this in the context of the group of nonconformist women writers he works on, about how, you know, we have to think really hard about the creative lives of these women not being a lesser thing because they weren't being published, but, you know, still being really significant and enriching for them. You do get the sense that there's a sort of, yeah, there's a, a playfulness in letters, which actually, you know, print is never going to allow for in the same way, I don't think. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's lots of in-jokes in Cooper's letters to William Bull as well, which is quite funny. One of the things he doesn't like about Bull is that he smokes tobacco too much. And so he kind of weaves that into his letters and in little poems that he puts in his letters. Letters are such a vehicle for occasional poetry, which people think about a lot when it comes to someone like John Keats. You know, people are very well aware of that kind of creative practice of trying things out in letters mm. but it really extended very widely and to people who were never planning to publish either and Mercy Doddridge asks Sally Wesley to send poems to her that Sally Wesley has written too. I'm thinking really hard about the pleasure of the recipient which is not something we ever do when writing emails but <laughs> Cooper that was really important you know he said he wanted to know not just about his friends but of his friends in his writing yeah. and yeah, going back to what we were originally talking about, about friendship and letters, Cooper uses this appellation of friends so often in his letters, more than other men that I've worked on in this period. I don't that, that it would be a good to do a kind of statistical analysis on a corpus of letters about that, because it's really striking to me how often he addresses people as friend and talks about other friends. And Mercy Doddridge and Sally Wesley do the same. So I wonder if, too, that's a way of... Um, kind of reaffirming similarities with people who have differences to you, religious denominational differences, perhaps, or social differences. Um, yeah, that you can use letters to kind of reassure them that your friendship is heartfelt. Mm -hmm.